Okay, we can start. Thank you, Danny, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So I would like to apologize in advance because my voice is not going to be very stable. You know, there's no better way to catch a virus or a cold when you fly. And this, uh, and this happened exactly last week. Uh, so thanks for coming. I see many new faces with respect to the last week. I hope that these faces are staying here until the end. But I, I'm not very confident in that, but let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to be boring enough. Okay, so a recent results on nonlinear potential theory. Uh, what is it about? Uh, and, okay, the classical potential theory is uh, essentially something that deals with the fine properties of solutions uh, of uh, linear elliptic and eventually parabolic equations, and in particular harmonic functions. This is something which is very classical. Um, maybe in the last two centuries, and it reached as an abstract way its peak, the, the classical linear theory with the work of Bellot, Choquet, Denis, and this seminar of people working in Paris, starting from the 30s and uh, going on maybe until today. Okay, what is then a uh, nonlinear potential theory about? It's uh, essentially all you can say uh, in the linear theory, but referring not any longer to um, solutions to linear equations, but to nonlinear equations, to uh, nonlinear and actually possibly degenerate equations. Okay, of course there will be several assumptions and uh, the results will change accordingly to the assumptions, but the idea is that uh, we want to keep essentially the same linear uh, results, but when dealing with solutions to nonlinear equations. Um, um, Okay, what's the main difference? For instance, if you think of, uh, of an elliptic uh, or a parabolic equation, then you will see that, for instance, you can get uh, um, solutions via convolutions uh, with a fundamental solution. But this is not any longer possible when you deal with nonlinear equations, but still you will keep the, the shape and the rigidity of the estimates given by the, the representation formulas in the nonlinear setting. Okay, let me be more specific and let me give a brief outline of the course. Okay, this matter largely intersects with what is called the, the calderon zeeman theory, which is, uh, let's say, another classical fact for harmonic analysis and PDs. And I will start recalling something from the classical calderon zeeman theory that actually can be framed in the setting of the linear potential theory. I will then explain how to go from uh, linear to nonlinear calderon zeeman theory. And uh, this is the, 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 the first time we see how to avoid the, the, the idea of using uh, fundamental solutions and representation formula and going directly to uh, results that can be obtained by estimates. <coughs> then I will tell something about uh, parabolic problems because there are additional technical difficulties that eventually led to significant simplifications of a few original proofs, including the classical calderon zeeman theory. And then I will explain something about uh, non-uniform elliptic operators, which is something very new at this stage. Um, because uh, the first three passages, the first three points are dealing with uh, uh, what, is called, what are called uh, uniform elliptic operators. Then I'll go to measure the other problems. And I don't know why these problems are important, because essentially this, uh, this is essentially more or less the minimal regularity allowed on data in order to get uh, properties and solutions. I will go then to nonlinear potential theory and I'll uh, largely talk about uh, <coughs> um, potential estimates. Potential estimates are really at the core of both the classical linear and the nonlinear theory. And finally, sketches from uh, sketches of non-local theory, uh, because something non-local should be here, because the, actually the, 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 the period, this intensive period, period focuses on non-local operators, and uh, then I will give uh, very recent results obtained in collaboration with the Tomo Kusi and Yannick Sier um, uh, on uh, non-local potential theory, and I will also talk about recent work of uh, Tomo Kusi and Gianpiero Palatucci, who is also in partner with me, uh, about uh, how to build a nonlinear uh, potential theory in the non local framework. Okay, that's the outline. Okay, the classical Calderon Zygmunt theory. Uh, okay, the classical Calderon Zygmunt theory can be very well explained if you look at this, uh, if you look at this model, uh, model equation. So, this model equation tells essentially that the Laplacian is equal to f and you prescribe where the Laplacian is. 
The Laplacian is nothing but the trace of the Hessian, of the matrix of second derivatives of the solution. Therefore, the best thing you can get, and what you would expect if the equation behaves correctly, is that uh, you can commute uh, the, 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 the trace in the whole Hessian. In other words, you say where f is, and you want to read, you, where f is prescribes, of course, where the trace is, and then you want to convert this uh, information into the whole action, so in the whole second derivatives. So this is the classical work of uh, Calder and Sigmund in the 50s, and um, there are several versions, several results. This is possibly the most classical and best trained one, and this tells that um, what you would expect by simple, um, um, let's say, dimensional analysis, uh, this means that the whole action is where the trace is. Um, so if f is in LQ, then you know that uh, the second derivatives are in the same LQ, except for the cases, for the borderline cases, Q is equal to 1 in infinity. Well, this is known to be false by counterexamples. So how do you do this? How do you prove this? Okay, as a consequence, you get then also, uh, you get also the sum of embedding theory, and then you get optimal integrability on the gradient. And this just follows by a classical sum of embedding. Theory. So this is a sharp um, is a sharp integrability and differentiability result from solutions of the equation. So what's the classical strategy? The classical strategy uh, uh, is that uh, the problem is linear, so you have a fundamental solution. Uh, forget about all the, the I mean all the, uh, the the assumptions uh, that you um, that you might want to. To put to make this representation rigorous, for instance, you can take the unique harmonic functions that k is at zero to infinity, uh, and uh, then ux can be uh, represented uh, with a convolution via, via the fundamental solution, which is the Green's function, and this is this one. Okay, you are interested in second derivatives, and therefore you are differentiating twice on the sine of integral, and what you come up with is a singular kernel. Um, this is best frame when uh, n is larger, strictly larger than 2. And why is this singular? Because you know that g goes like 2 minus n. When you differentiate twice, then this 2 disappears, and you get something which has a real singular kernel in the sense that this is not locally integrable. So singular means that this is not locally integrable, not just that it blows up. You see, this kernel, it blows up, but it's locally integrable. <coughs> okay. Then the idea of Calder and Sigmund is uh, forget about the equation, let's consider this operator, and let's consider this, uh, the mapping properties of this operator. If it happens to, if you know that this operator, that is the one that maps f into this uh, convolution integral, maps lq into lq, then you're done. That's, that's the basic idea. Okay, and this was in fact the, 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 this was in fact the, the case, because uh, um, under these assumptions, because okay, what's the main uh, what's the main point here? The main point is the following: is there a chunk around yeah. The main point is the following: uh, you get that k of x is more or less like this one in terms of size plus something, which is this. Okay, the idea is that if you now want to just use the size properties of these guys. Then if you just use the size properties, then you will come up with something like this, and you're done. This is very bad. But now the main uh, new idea of Calvin and Sigmund that extends actually uh, one-dimensional uh, formal work of Marcel Ries is that uh, there are cancellation properties. In fact, <coughs> uh, if, you, if you know, if you have now a general operator of the previous type, now forget that k of x is the just uh, the second derivatives of the Green's function. Now take any kernel operator that satisfies this property. So the Fourier transform is bounded. This is typical when you just decay here as one or x to the n. And uh, there are cancellations enough to get that this guy is finite. Then this operator maps out q into lq for every q different than my own k. Uh, these are not the original uh, forms of cancellations considered by Calderon and Sigmund. This is a later generalization due to Oermander. But essentially, the main idea is the following one. And it, and it is an idea that you can nowadays see uh, ubiquitously in the modern nonlinear analysis. So the idea is the following one. If you have a quantity, A plus B, the wrong thing to do is doing this. Because you lose too much. So you have to exploit cancellations, as I said. So this, uh, and this is a general fact that occurs everywhere, 
when you deal, for instance, with, uh, on, uh, with elliptic systems with critical growth conditions, harmonic maps, um, uh, uh, borderline integrability conditions, uh, uh, integrability intersects with uh, wide uh, pieces of harmonic analysis as those one dealing with RT properties and cancellations and related cancellations, uh, that whenever size is not enough, then look for additional cancellations. These additional cancellations will give you the, uh, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the slight additional information that eventually saves you and allows you to treat the critical cases. So critical cases cannot be dealt with when you, uh, when you use size growth conditions. You look for cancellations and then a, a very heat and cancellation saves you and brings you back to the real problems you can treat. So that's, and this is one example. So essentially it occurs very often when you deal, for max, when you deal with, uh, when you deal with uh, maximal breakdown. Okay, this is the idea. <coughs> as, you can, as you can clearly see, this idea is completely linear because it, it, it builds on the it builds on the fact that you have a fundamental solution. So it is not only based on the fact that the problem is linear, but you also need to know the structure. So therefore, uh, historically speaking, there was a large deal uh, of the works in the 60s using parametrics analysis to deal uh, with uh, all possible kinds of fundamental solutions, essentially. This was the historical concept. concept. So linearity is essential at this stage. Um, OK. These cancellations are absolutely <coughs> important if you want to deal the maximum regularity. That is the regularity of the second derivatives. If you want to get something less, then you don't need cancellations. You go back to the to, to size analysis. And for instance, you can introduce this uh, um, convolutions kernels, which are called RIS, uh, RIS, uh, RIS potentials, RIS operators. You see that now the kernel is locally integrable because beta is larger than zero. Beta, okay, beta is larger than zero. It's not, it's not allowed to be zero here. There's a small typo. And if you just want to get the, the maximal properties of the, of the integrability of the gradient, now you don't need to look for cancellations any, anymore. You just look for the size properties. You use a um, certain refined type of Young's inequality, Young's convolutions inequalities, and then you get integrability of the gradient. So now you can clearly see the difference between maximal regularity and intermediate regularity. The maximal regularity is the second derivatives, is the one about the second derivatives, and you need cancellations. Here you, uh, you, you don't want to get uh, the second derivatives, but just the gradient, and you don't need cancellations. That's a, a typical fact that relates to what I was saying before. I mean, maximal regularity needs additional cancellation analysis. Okay, the important remark is that uh, this is what I was saying. And of course, the same applies when you have a right-hand side in divergence form. So observe that, uh, okay, for instance, consider this equation, Laplacian of u equals to divergence of f. And now, what is, what is the result you expect? The Laplacian of u is obviously equal to the, the divergence of the gradient, and this is prescribed to be the divergence of something else. So the, the first year engineering calculus student would then, would then do the following. I have this equation, I see dip and dip, and then I do this. And in terms of spaces, this says that uh, du is an LQ provided f is it. Although the proof of the first year engineering student is wrong, it involves a dimensional analysis argument that is correct. So this is what you get, and this is in fact the same, uh, the same of what you get here. And now do you do? You do exactly as before, because now, you see, now you have a divergent side, a right-hand side which is in divergence form, so you don't get any information on the secondary of this, but on the gradient itself, because that's the equation, that, that's what the, the equation is telling you. Okay, how do you do this? Uh, you have this equation, equals divergence of S, so let's argue formally. You get Ux, which is a uh, convolution of the Green's function with uh, the divergence of f. Okay, let's assume that you can do whatever you like. So we integrate by parts and we shift the divergence over here, getting the first derivative of the, of the kernel and now it's f. 
Then you uh, differentiate under the sign of integral, and then you get that du is like uh, the second derivative of g, and that's once again the kernel, a Calvin single term kernel in involving the same kind of cancellations you had before, and uh, therefore you, uh, you, you, you conclude with the same theorem. Well, it's more or less, uh, I mean, the heuristic kind of <laughs> Okay, up to now you need the operator. Okay. Now, uh, we are interested in the passing from linear to nonlinear problems, and therefore we want to avoid <coughs> the use of as many as linear tools as possible. <coughs> and in particular, of the delicate cancellation property of the Calvin Zippel kernels. Okay, the first step in this direction was uh, achieved in the, in the 60s by two Italian mathematicians that are. Guido Stampacchia and Sergio Campagna. So the idea is the following. You, let me consider this problem. So let me fix, for instance, a pole P1, or a regular domain, and let me consider the solution to this problem. U is equal to zero on the boundary. Then you consider this operator that maps F into the gradient of the solution, and this is obviously linear. This is a linear operator because everything is linear here. If you take two solutions, you add them up anyway. That's linear. Okay, then just testing, testing the equation trivially gives you that this maps L2 into L2. You just test the equation by what? By the most simple test function possible, which is u, and then you get that u squared can be controlled by f squared. This is just simple use of Young's integral. And then this is a trivial fact. This is a, a fact that, in some sense, is uh, parallel to the fact that, that in uh, when dealing with calculus equal operator, operators, you need that the kernel as um, as a bounded Fourier transform. So this is uh, the analog of this guy. Then, what about the counterpart of the cancellation properties? Then you map. Then you, you prove that this operator uh, sends L infinity into BMO. BMO is a space which, uh, which still contains unbounded functions, but which is still close enough to L infinity to allow for certain interpolation properties. What this BMO is described as follows. <coughs> this was introduced originally in a paper by John Neal in 1958 and 59. It was eventually used by Moser in his new proof of its, its new approach to the George Nash theory. And, uh, okay, consider the average of a function B, which is supposed to be positive at this stage. Now, you know that if B is in L infinity, then all these averages are bound. And this is essentially equivalent to say that, that B is in L infinity, by the big theory. Now, you don't consider this average, but you do the following thing. You take P, you subtract its average, and you do consider the average of this guy. So if there will be squared here, this is something, this is nothing but a mean squared deviation. So this is the L1 mean deviation. Now you assume that this is bounded at every scale. So you see, assuming that infinity means that this is bounded at every scale, assuming the amount, this means that this guy with an involving featuring an additional cancellation is bounded at every scale. So this is BMO. And actually, BMO is when this goes to zero. BMO was introduced by Sir Aronson in 1976, and it's uh, nothing but the closure of uh, C infinity in BMO, of continuous functions. OK, so BMO obviously contains an infinity, but it's still close to an infinity. So <coughs> the hard part, the harder part, is that this operator maps into an infinity into BMO. It's false that it, it maps L infinity into L infinity, but maps L infinity to something which is slightly larger than BMO, than L infinity. But it's close enough to L infinity to still allow for interpolation theorem. And this is actually, uh, these are the two steps proved by uh, Campanato and Stampak. So the first thing is that you notice these two properties, and then you prove an interpolation theorem, which is at this stage, which is not uh, trivial, that any uh, linear actually some linear operator uh, that maps L, L2 into L2 and L infinity into BMO, uh, then actually maps L2 into L2 for L infinity. 
This solves the issue for Q large and into a dead by duality you can go. Okay, then you might wonder where uh, is the concept of cancellation, uh, where, uh, where the concept of cancellation is. And according to a general principle of uh, conservation of difficulties in mathematics, uh, you, you are not avoiding actually cancellations. Cancellations are hidden in the definition of BMO. Because BMO needs that these quantities are bounded at every scale, and these quantities involve cancellations so at the same time considered by Calder and Zeno. How do you prove basic structure properties on BMO and in this, this kind of interpolation? Uh, think that using this uh, certain type of decompositions that reminds you those introduced by Calvin. So you see that this, the, the, the same ideas are shifting between one approach and another. But you are not avoiding cancellations yet. They are just hidden into something else. They are moved, they are moved somewhere else because actually you can avoid them. Okay, this was the second approach, but the important thing is that now no fundamental solution is needed. Okay, this is the past. These are the classical. And now we go to nonlinear Calvin and Zygmunt theory. And essentially, the nonlinear Calvin and Zygmunt theory I'm going to talk about considers these operators, divergence of the U, so these are quasi linear, are not yet fully nonlinear, but then we will see that these operators are actually uh, more involved than fully nonlinear operators. Why? Because we allow these operators to be degenerate. Essentially, there's no way, no trivial way of linearizing those operators as you can do with fully nonlinear using Pucci's operator. And uh, okay, here are all these problems. If you if you try uh, any one of the previous two approaches, you come up with nothing. First of all, because there's no fundamental solution, or actually, there's a fundamental solution in the sense that you can put a Dirac here solve for certain operators, but then you don't uh, obtain other solutions to the convolution. And if you try to define the operator that now maps you, you into the gradient of this guy, for instance, there's no, no way that, I mean, there's no reason that this is going to be linear or sublinear whatsoever. So the, the two approaches pitifully fail at this stage. So you need a more uh, concrete approach. And I will consider actually I will split the problem in two. I will consider the natural domain of definition of these operators that actually will be a subordinate space for p larger than one. And then I will split uh, the, the treatment in two uh, different sections. The first one is when the right hand side belongs to the dual. And the second one, where it does not belong to the dual, and this is the most delicate case, which is still partially uh, unsolved. <clears throat> or largely unsolved, it depends on the on the on the on the case on the on the viewpoint of people. Okay. Actually, these are the conditions that I'm going to consider. And uh, what is behind these conditions? These conditions are classical after the work of Maliszewski and Rialzo, but behind this condition there is nothing but uh, our beloved classical the generator operator, that's the Pilaplash operator. This is the Pilaplash operator, and it naturally comes, this equation for instance, when the right hand side is zero, it naturally arises as the Euler equation of this functional when you make variations so you make. <coughs> then you classify all kinds of these possible operators that have these properties, monotonicity, which stands uh, from electricity properties, and growth conditions. These growth conditions tell you that when you do consider the weak form of this equation, then uh, the natural space of definition, let's say the largest space you can test off with uh, is the by density, if this is uh, the weak formulation on the right hand side is zero, then with this growth condition you can automatically pass from C infinity, where this has to belong by distribution of definition, to W1P by density and growth conditions. So essentially in this in this sense, this this tells this growth condition tells that uh, the, the operator is well defined in W1P. So when you play tilde, it means there exists constants which is successfully Yeah, exactly. There's a universal constant which is just independent of nothing. 
they say it will just depend on certain electricity operators. Okay, take a fixed constant which is which is not depending on anything. These are the electricity properties. Okay, essentially for pilage and into the previous electricities. This so one. What's the, what's the, the V function is this one. It's, uh, let's say, a general vector field, an auxiliary vector field that allows you to formulate in a particularly convenient and compact way the monotonicity properties of the operators. Because you see, V squares is like P over 2, then when you square it, you go back to P, P growth. When P is larger than 2, then this is the usual P monotonicity. Otherwise, it is what it is. That is the best you can get with, you know, when you deal with a P Laplacian operator. That's, uh, that's exactly the thing. Okay. For instance, these are classical, uh, these are classical implied by requiring that A is more differentiable, for instance, is C1, and then you prescribe these conditions which are classical after the, the very classical book uh, of Lavishinsky and Wells. In fact, the pila Plasian operator and its regularity properties are included in this book, but in the second Russian edition, not in the first Russian, not in the first edition. In fact, I remember I was in St. Peter's book in 2001, and I was, uh, in fact, uh, invited by Wielsa at her place for dinner, and she gave me this, and she told me this, and then Lagishinskaya gave me as a gift uh, the second Russian edition. And of course, I could not read. But I know it's there. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, and then this uh, important theorem marks the beginning of what is called, what can be now is called nonlinear counter sigma theory, and essentially the counterpart of the theorem I was telling you before, for the, with the Laplacian. This tells you, again with the first year engineering calculus students' argument, that the gradient is where f is. So when p is equal to two, this is essentially the, the previous result. Otherwise, it's the optimal thing you can get. It's the analog of the previous result, but for one main point that uh, you know, that for the, for the Laplacian, this is true for any Q larger than one. So you would expect here any Q larger than P minus one, but you only get P. So an important range of parameters, that is this one, let's say this one, is left open. And this is still an open problem for this result. Because it changes duality. Yeah, because there's a, there's a, because you see, you just cannot start because you cannot test. So you start from a very weak solution, what is called a very weak solution, that is a distributional solution to this equation, which is nothing but one p. Then you just cannot test. At this stage, this is maybe a good point to remark the following thing. If you do consider the weak formulation of this equation, the weak formulation of this equation is nothing but the following one. You take du to the p minus 2, and then you take du, p phi. So by, so if u belongs to w1p, then you can test with u. So you can test with something which is proportional to u, because we say before that by density you can test up to w1p. Uh, on the other hand, what is the largest space, the largest sample space for which this uh, makes sense in the distributional setting? In the distributional setting, you know that phi is infinity, so you just require that this object is in L1, and this amounts to require that this is in W1, P minus 1. So an energy solution of this equation is a solution that belongs to W1, P, so where you start from the, from the very uh, energy space. A very weak solution is something that belongs to LQ with Q less than P. And essentially, you cannot test, so you just can't start. But still, it's a remarkable theorem due to AT, due to Ivanitz in 82. <coughs> what is the Ivanitz idea? Um, it's once again the following. So, you cannot deal with the fundamental solutions, you cannot do interpolation. Uh, so, what you do, you combine a bit of the method of Campagnano and Sapakia making local comparisons, that's what they do, to make interpolation, but you cannot do interpolation. And so you just replace, you, play, you replace, you make a local comparison, how does Ivanians prove this theorem, making a, a local comparison of your original solution with solutions to the homogeneous problem, that is this one,
So he made a uh, he locally considers solutions to these problems. Please don't write slowly. Yeah, you're writing. You're writing. Yeah, okay, but this is this can be seen, right? More or less. Yeah. Can, it. can be seen more or less. And then these solutions, they do enjoy good estimates because they are pure modic. What is the homogeneity here? It is 1 over r to the n, that's the measure of the ball. And this locally plays the role of a fundamental solution, or the representation of a fundamental solution. And then to patch up all these things, uses uh, the sharp maximal operator introduced by Pfeffer and Einstein. The sharp maximal operator is the thing that is usually controls and it's controlled by its singular input. So he replaces singular. So you see the ingredients and the main ideas are still there. They are not directly there, but their ghosts are there. And uh, so therefore, you, he replaces the, the representation formula is, re, is uh, replaced by local estimates. And then to patch these estimates on, uses maximal operators that replace the conceptual in the use of singular ideas. So it's a slow shift between the linear to the linear. You still, you're still using harmonic analysis in the sense that you are using maximal operators instead of singular integrals. And then the Benedict and Manfredi, they also prove the following three for systems. And when f is in the above, then u is in the above. This is the Benedict and Manfredi. Eventually, Cassolani and Peral gave another proof of this result. And uh, their proof is still based on local comparisons with harmonic functions and the use of not of the sharp maximal operator, but of the sharp uh, of the maximal operator itself. Apparently, Cassolani and Peral were not aware of the work of Ibanez. The ideas are rather close. But it still provides another uh, approach to this problem. Essentially, there was a. Uh, um, that the, they were mm, very likely not aware of the work of the bias. And eventually, starting from these papers, that there's a big, big, big list of uh, papers of authors that generalize all these kinds of problems into parabolic paper, uh, parabolic uh, settings, um, uh, equations with coefficients, human coefficients, boundary data, and uh, all these papers are worth taking a look at. And there's a large literature that eventually stems from this on these originals. Eventually, there's also another approach by Kridov that once again uses local comparison with, uh, with, uh, with solutions to this in the linear case and the use of maximal, sharp maximal operator. And this is very close to the one on the line. So I think that also Kridov was not aware of, of the line speed. And then these are, these are, these are a few others. Okay, this is the local estimate you get because the result comes along. The result is local, then uh, global versions provide the boundaries to be right here and blah, blah. The result, the local version of the result comes along with the local estimate, which is the best possible. You see, this is the classical QP reverse in the world of PR modic functions when the right hand side is zero, and when the right hand side is not zero, you replay, you correct it with the same degree. And um, in the same way, the same result works for every equation equation as before. It works for systems, provided the, the principal part has this so-called quasi-diagonal structure. So the nonlinearity concentrates along the diagonal and is still proportional to the gradient. This is a structure first considered by Euler back in their famous paper from C D P seven. And that the PMO coefficients can be considered. The result stops being true for any system because systems with no additional structure, as a P of Lasher, for instance, they develop singularities on their own, even when the right hand side is zero. So you take the system, divergence A of the U with the same assumptions, the right hand side is zero, and then you see that the solution is unbounded. So the result cannot be true because would the result be true, then this would imply that the gradient is in every LQ and the solution is almost slip sheets, while the solution is not even bounded. Okay, open problem, that's open problem. Uh, what about the full range?
What about the full range? The full range is, um, is still an open problem, and this is a very, very hard open problem. It is an open problem that connects to several other basic things in modern linear analysis, like the optimal bounds for constants in the Berlin transform, rank one and quasi complexity in two dimensions, and so forth. There are beautiful surveys by Tanel Shiraians that I recommend to read for those who are interested in, in this. I mean, this is a very hard and classic problem. It's not uh, certain nonsense. This is really real stuff. I mean. <coughs> the only result I know in this direction is due to Tadeo Shivanez and Carlos Bordone. Tadeo Shivanez is in Syracuse, Carlos Bordone is in Napoli, and then um, almost at the same time, a bit later, by John Lewis, who is in Kentucky. Uh, so what they prove is that there exists a microscopic still po positive epsilon such that uh, the result is true. Actually, they prove that every solution, every very weak solution, then belongs is a real solution. And after this, you can go back to proving the full result. Because as I told you before, the main abstraction is that when you when you want to prove that re this result, the main abstraction is that uh, when you get that. Uh, when you get a very weak solution, that is a distributional solution, which is not in the natural energy space, then you don't know how to test. Then this result of Ivan Yatsen's Bourdon and of Lewis tells you that if you are very weak, but let's say moderately you know, very weak, with an epsilon that is independent of, of the solution itself, is universal, but still can be very small, then uh, <coughs> you actually are in W1P, and then you can restart bringing you back to the real more energy solutions you are able to, to treat. Um, the proof I prefer mostly is uh, the one of Ivan and Sens Bordone, because the proof of Ivan and Sens Bordone shows a, a very deep property of logic decompositions. Yeah? Are there any estimates about the dependence of epsilon from P? <laughs> there are, of course, you can imagine that a lot of people try to get estimates. Uh, sharp estimates are not known because in the case of the pure Russian, this is conjectured to be one. So you can go up to one. There are, of course, estimates. These estimates are, let's say, <coughs> some sense, uh, trivially re retrievable, um, tracking back the dependence on the constants in the very scalars. But this is, let's say, a trivial way because this is far from beyond being optimal. And then there are, uh, there's a paper by Daniels and Martin where they make, they make uh, related computations uh, on these kinds of things. Okay, the, the approach of Daniels and Bordone is very nice and maybe deserves a few words because it's, uh, it's interesting. And essentially, let me go back to this equation and to its, uh, to, to, its, uh, uh, to its weak form. So this is Daniels. And it's Bordone. Um, so as I told you, if you want to if you want to test this guy here, you need that um, d phi is in LP. But if you and so therefore if you if you start from something which is not in LP then phi is equal to u is not allowed. Not allowed. So what would you do? You would like to take something which is proportional here to u because you want to use electricity. So you want to test. You, you want to get a test function which is proportional of the u, so it has the same direction, so you can use monotonicity. But on the other hand, this you cannot do. So the first thing that pops up in your mind is that you divide this by du with epsilon zero, so you kill a bit of integrability, and therefore you're gaining integrability. Because this is a, for epsilon large, for epsilon positive, sorry, this kills the integrability of this guy, so it improves the integrability of this guy. Because it kills the growth. So what's the problem with the test function? This is not a gradient in general. If you take a gradient and you divide by another function, this is not a gradient. So what do you do is then you, you write down this guy, you make the Hodge decomposition. The Hodge decomposition means that you write it as a gradient of something else, 
plus something which is uh, <coughs> or three, and then this is H. <coughs> so you want to test this guy. Now this is now this you can take. This you can take as a test function. If you take this as a test function, you get one good term, which is the one standing from this object. But then you will have the one standing from H. And then the contribution of the x is point on is showing that you can prove that if epsilon is small, then H is small accordingly. So you can eventually reabsorb it in your, in your simple electricity trick. So in the right norm, Q prime, this is smaller than epsilon something else. And then you can, you can work out. Like this. this is where the condition on epsilon comes from. You'll take epsilon zero, and then you eventually choose epsilon zero enough in order to reabsorb the bad term, and then you come up with the end. It's a very simple trick, but it's a very deep trick because it's uh, and its proof is beautifully obtained in this paper by Daniel Sisko using a, a very simple fact from uh, complex analysis, which is known as the uh, Schwarz lemma. They made uh, they made, uh, it's a one-page proof. They just use Schwarz lemma, so it's in the in the tradition of Adamar telling that the fastest way between two real points passes along your complex axis, <laughs> right? And it's... <coughs> okay, Lewis instead makes another thing, which is a Lipschitz truncation. So he uses a device. Um, a device um, developed in the, the beginning of the 80s by Jean Fusco. And essentially, it's, uh, you take the gradient, you consider the maximal operator of the gradient, you tr make a truncation of the maximal operator, and then you can construct the Lipschitz. In some sense, you've done, in, with the Hodge decomposition method, you improve a bit the integrability. And with the other method, you improve up to the very end in the sense that the gradient of the new function becomes. Um, a boundary, but at the end, the axon is always still there. Okay, in the parabolic setting, there are uh, interesting uh, approaches by Kinu, that I once again, John Lewis, is a very, very technical and interesting figure. And then there's a, um, an existence result which has been uh, recently obtained, obtained by Bullshek and Spatzacker. I think it's published on one of the last issues of cut part <coughs> Okay. This is essentially a very fast... Uh, what time is it? Uh, quarter to three. Quarter, quarter to three. three. That clock's about right. Uh, oh, there's a clock there. Right. I didn't notice that. Okay. Now we go to parabolic problems and um, uh, essentially... Uh, um, now, the bad thing of this, uh, this technique of Ivanitz is that uh, you cannot replicate the, um, the, the, Ivanitz, um, the Ivanitz argument when you go to the parabolic uh, problems. Essentially, the whole technique fails because you cannot use maximal operators. Um, and uh, very and this is a, the very basic core. Okay, you cannot repeat this as long as P is different than 2. For P equals to 2, the same approach applies to the button, uh, but for P different than 2, no way. So the problem of extending this to the parabolic setting has remained open since a few years ago, and this was actually uh, fixed by Emilio Scherbe and myself uh, uh, 10 years ago, where we essentially prove exactly the same result, but for this lower bound of P, which is still natural in the sense that the result stops being true if uh, you go below P. Then I will essentially show you below. Okay. Um, for, for, P, uh, for, for a very small epsilon, so the result was still obtained by Kimon and Lewis in, uh, in another paper in Newt Mathematical Journal. So Kimon and Lewis were able to treat the case uh, P, P, Q, uh, okay, very, very small <coughs> thing, but then the, 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 the full result is obtained in this paper uh, with the media share. Uh, okay, what did we do in this paper? We essentially introduced a third method to prove Calvin's Zygmunt estimates, which is now completely free from uh, 
uh, from any uh, monic analysis tool, like maximal operators and so forth. So we give a purely PDE maximal operator pre-proof of the, of the result, and eventually you can go back to the to the usual result, and you can give, um, let's say, a one-page proof of the full Calderon signal theory uh, that avoids interpolation, that avoids cancellations, and it's just based on Vitalis covering lemma and, and the mean, mean value properties of harmonic functions. Essentially, you can give uh, now the full Calderon signal theory in one page in um, 20 minutes in, uh, say, an undergraduate course with this method. Okay, uh, these are the features of these results, and then this is essentially what I was saying, is that you give a, an harmonic analysis free approach to nonlinear covalent signal theory. So this ends up the passage, of course, from linear to nonlinear, you just forget about so the harmonic analysis tools. Of course, you're not forgetting about harmonic analysis ideas because you're still keeping these ideas. So yeah, meaning, meaning that you don't use the tools doesn't mean that you are not using the ideas that are making the tools for it. It's the uh, same thing. So we essentially, what we essentially do is, uh, is we combine uh, in, um, we combine uh, the ideas behind Calder and sequence decompositions and um, good lambda inequalities into a PDE setting where we are not explicitly using the tools. So we adapt the ideas. Eventually, this method has now become very popular. I counted something like 150 pages that have been written in this state. It has become, let's say, a, a very standard, this technique. We introduced uh, a bit more than 10 years ago. Um, once again, you can treat any general equation. You can treat parabolic systems, provided the quasi-diagonal structure is considered. So not any system is considerable. At this stage. And this is what I will say. So these are the operators you can still consider. Okay, now let's, uh, let's uh, <coughs> start seeing a few differences between the elliptic case and the parabolic case. In the elliptic case, you get this uh, local a priori estimate which is, of course, the one you would expect. It's homogeneous, because the equation is homogeneous, and uh, this is what you would like to have. You see that uh, the estimate is homogeneous because if you multiply f by a constant c, then you get a solution which is still proportional to the same constant. So if the equation has a scaling uh, and has its own homogeneity properties, then you get homogeneous estimates because the, the form of the a priori estimates reflects the structure of the equation. Of course, if you do consider now the parabolic part, there's no way that this estimate can be obtained if p is different than 2, because now this equation is not homogeneous anymore. Why? Because if you multiply this by constant c, then this k is like p minus 1, p minus 1, but this k is like 1. And so, all the p equals the 2. That's the case that can be still treated with uh, previous methods. Uh, in fact, let me just consider for simplicity the case p larger than 2. This is the estimate we are using. So we get essentially the same estimate, same elliptic estimate, but with the, uh, what we call the scaling deficit exponent that reflects the disomogeneity of the equation. Because in, uh, when, you test, when you test this equation by u, you multiply it by u, now you will see that this grows like p, this, after Young's inequality, grows like p, but this grows like 2, so the scaling deficit in the weak form is p over 2, and that's exactly what you get uh, back in the energy system. So you're going to... Oh, yeah. Thanks. These are the standard parabolic cylinders, of course. <coughs> standard parabolic cylinders are those ones stemming from the classical heat equation to compensate uh, the lack of one derivative with respect to time. 
So they scale r in space, r square in time, to compensate the lack uh, of differentiability of, uh, of one time derivative. So if you want to replace this with the parabolic thing, you can do it, but praying the price, which is natural, because you see, otherwise an estimate of this kind would simply be impossible, because otherwise you multiply f by a constant, you make a scale, and then you would get, uh, you let the constant c go into zero, and then you'll get that every solution is uh, z, which is uh, certainly not the case. And this is the scaling deficit. Um, <coughs> actually, a more precise form of the estimate is the following one, where the dependence on Q just appears in front on the right hand side data. In particular, when f is not there, so this is zero, you can let q to plus infinity, and then you get this estimate, which recovers the classical estimate from the ages of the data and filter. So in a sense, the estimate is stable with respect to the regularity of the right hand side. <coughs> this is what you get. And uh, in particular, when uh, you are in the singular case, when p is less than or equal than this guy, um, then 2n is larger than 2n over n plus 2, then the estimate rechanges, and uh, this is the exponent you get. And this exponent blows up when p approaches that quantity. You see, this quantity is always larger than 1, because it's 1 plus something. So when P approaches this quantity, this blows up and makes all the information get lost. And this reflects the fact that the estimate uh, uh, fails to be true when P is less than this. this other. I will try to explain uh, the meaning of this lower bound in terms of diffusion of the equation. Essentially, this is very well explained in terms of diffusion. Uh, diffusion is the following thing. So why solutions of the heat equations are regular? Because there is diffusion. Okay, there is diffusion. So the diffuser gets the elliptic part that is diffusing and regularizing that. Otherwise, the evolutionary part would tend to make things blow up because you're just about starting from the group. In particular, if you put a uh, coefficient here, you decrease or increase accordingly the diffusion rate. So if u is larger, you get better estimate. If u goes to zero, you eventually lose everything. OK, now we go to the Pilaplacian setting. And we do consider this equation. And uh, now, you see that this I can put inside. So this is your new. Now you want to prove, on one hand, that the gradient is, uh, not, I mean, not bounded, but it's good, okay? Oh, but let's prove it, let's consider that the right hand side is zero, so you want to prove that the gradient is bounded. On the other hand, if p is less than two, so the, the thing you want to exclude is that the gradient gets too large. And if the gradient gets too large and p is, is, two, is, two, is less than two, then this object goes to zero. So you lose all the diffusion properties. And of course, if P is too close to 1, then the speed with which this, this, this appears is too large, and in the competition, the evolution wins over the, wins over the, 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 evolution, the diffusion part, and then regularity is lost. And the threshold for the diffusion part to win is precisely this example. So this is a very rough, still uh, concrete explanation of the fact that when you're approaching, you're, you're too close to, to one, then you're losing your regularizing properties. That's, uh, that's uh, <laughs> This happens, of course, when the right hand side is zero, and for its theory, uh, it, uh, it influences the validity of the result when the right hand side is not zero, that can only worsen uh, the, the second. Okay, what time is it now? Okay, I think that this is uh, this is a good time to stop because tomorrow then I'll tell something about the, the techniques behind the, the proof of this result 
And this is essentially the technique where we match the intrinsic geometry ideas of the Morel and Infinity, and uh, we, we patch them with the Calvin theory. So that's all for today. Thank you.